Hey everyone, this is a short film bringing together some of our favourite people talking about sense making, exploring the nature of genuine conversation, collective intelligence, and also how we can steal the culture together. They're mostly taken from our recent Sense Making 101 course, which we're running again starting next week. So we'll start with a clip from Daniel Schmachtenberger, answering a question that many are wrestling with. Where do we even start? Whatever is in our field of attention will end up getting more emotional weight than the things that aren't in our field of attention and that maybe shouldn't be, right? So Facebook ran experiments of doping what goes in people's newsfeed and they could put more negative valence things and the people would start becoming depressed. More positive valence things, people start becoming positive. You can like change people's political views based on the preponderance of what's in their newsfeed because because we evolved to take in the world around us and the world around us couldn't be fucking curated. It, we evolved to see it with our eyes. And now when it's being curated, our evolutionary predisposition is to take what's coming in through our eyes as the world, right? And so when it's when it actually represents a 0. 0.00001 subset of the world, but it's the preponderance of everything, and I can infinitely scroll all within that 0.001%, then what happens is I get a false sense of the world, right? So... I can think that who becomes president is the most important fucking thing for me to figure out, even though I have almost no agency and it will probably, I can't even predict what the fuck difference it'll make in my life. And it can, it can become more consuming than how my kids are doing in school, which I have real agency on and is more consequential in the course of their whole life and how I feel about who I was as a parent in my life, right? Because my newsfeed isn't filled with my kid's school. Um, and um, so most, you know, like, do I get the vaccine or not? I have some choice in this, right? And so because I have some choice, it seems like it makes sense to like pay attention to it enough to make a good choice. Most of the big issues, like what is the real urgency of climate change or AI risk or the breakdown of democracy or whatever, most of us don't really have much choice in one way or the other. And it's almost just like, like studying it is almost the fascination porn that makes you want to look at an accident when you drive by slowly, right? It's like a, there's something very compelling about it for no good reason of anything you can, you can do about it. Now, you know, I talk about sense making, I pay attention to these things and I, I happen to have actually put my life in a position where I'm trying to do something about that, but that I still can't about all the issues. And, um, and honestly, if I was working as a doctor, or I was working as a as a school teacher or a, any number of other things, I would want to make sure more of my sense making was connected to how well I could serve the people in the world that was in front of me and my agency there. So I would say you need to step back from the input feed to be able to reflect more internally and say, what are the things I actually have agency over that I care about the most? And then how do I make sure that my, the preponderance of my attention matches the things I care about the most that I can do something about? And then to the degree that you see that other people seem to have some agency and you believe their sense making in a domain you care about, you're like, how can I support them? Maybe I donate to that particular thing. Maybe I share their information and boost it. Maybe I, whatever it is, right? Um, that's also a really valuable thing where you're like, I'm going to proxy support to something I can't do that much on my own, but I care about. Um, and that actually takes a lot less energy than stressing on it and still not knowing what the fuck to do. Um, when it comes to something like a choice you're gonna make, so say the vaccines, you can't know that if you spend a hundred hours researching it, you'll come up with a better answer than just going with your gut. Like the, the nature of the fallibility of the data and the fact that there there haven't been the long-term studies that we would want to see and the whatever, like you can't be sure that that hundred hours will actually make you make a better decision. Right. And uh, so either you make the decision that feels best for you and put it out of your mind and whatever solution you make, see if there's some mitigating things you can do. Right. So I know a bunch of people who decide to get the vaccine. They find naturopaths who say, well, here are things that will probably help your body metabolize it better and make it less 
likely to be harmful. Do we have any idea less likely to be harmful? No, because nobody's fucking studied getting the vitamin C IV associated with it over 30 years. Like it's just a guess, but it's reasonable guesses from smart people who have paid attention to it. Or you don't get it and you say, okay, I'm going to do the zinc and vitamin D and quercetin and ivermectin and green tea and that kind of shit to, to mitigate the possibility of getting it or whatever. Okay. So make the decision that seems the best with what you can see how you can kind of mitigate and recognize that a lot more investment wouldn't necessarily give you a higher confidence margin. That's also a part of it. Okay. But one thing I'll say is that like, you know, there's this biblical quote to those who have more shall be given to those who don't have the little they have will be taken away. It's kind of like the idea of the secret, but it's this, you know, I think everybody knows what it's like when, when someone feels really abundant in their relationships and friendships, the way that they show up in the world is more attractive to other people. When somebody feels like really bummed that they don't have a relationship and they don't have friendships and they're kind of down on the world and whatever, like they're kind of maximally not attractive. And so to those who don't have more is taken away to those who have more is given. There's just a, there is a auto poetic nature of the state we're in. Right. So if I feel a sense of that, the areas I'm paying attention to, I'm actually learning real things and I'm increasing my agency that will actually orient me to continue to increase my agency. And over time, I might be able to have more capacity to take on more things. If I am in a state of kind of uh, overwhelm and hopelessness, I will probably continue to <laughs> advance overwhelm and hopelessness because if I feel overwhelmed, I'm likely to look at something and say, I don't know what to make of this. And then look at another thing, look at another thing and not actually go deep enough to figure any fucking thing out and just propagate right. overwhelm and hopelessness. <clears throat> so the question okay. of how can I center in my actual sense of agency and grow it and you grow it by acting on it and empowering it is a uh, part of the long term consideration. Next up, we've got Sarah Ness, who's been applying authentic relating and conversational skills to hot cultural topics. Conversation really is, in many ways, I think, a game. Like we talk about game A and game B. I think game B is really understanding um, that conversation can be, uh, that there there are uh, skills you can learn in it. There are ways that we can talk better with each other. There are ways that we can bring our curiosity and our, our impact and our feeling and our understanding into conversation. It's not just a, well, this is the way I did it when I'm a kid and when I was a kid and now I do that for the rest of my life. So I've been doing a, several workshops with Rebel Wisdom now, both around connection and um, they've been kind enough to give me the space to develop some ideas and games around how this can be used in what I think is one of the biggest questions of our time, which is how do we communicate through polarization and across divides? Um, so that's a little bit of what we're going to be playing with today. And what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a model that I've been using lately to describe some of why we, why we seem to get into conflict and have a hard time communicating past it. Let's go into this model that I've been playing with this content context concern. I, uh, no model will ever encompass the complexity of being human, but um, I think sometimes having frames can be helpful for us. So um, I think that in any given situation, we have content, which is the level we're speaking at. We have contexts, which are, which are our beliefs about what is true, like what we think we're in together, what is reality. And by the way, this is subjective too. The classic example I give is like, we go out for coffee. I think we're hanging out. You think it's a date we have very different kind of reactions to what's happening in that scenario. We have different expectations about what's going to happen. Um, or in the vaccination example that I keep giving, um, I think that we're having kind of a theoretical discussion about vaccination in order to understand the possible perspectives. And for you, you think that I'm trying to convince you as to why you should get vaccinated. We're going to have really different reactions to the conversations, right? So this this is beliefs. This is um, kind of the top level like frame through which we're going to see the world. So one of the things that can happen in conversation is just asking about like, okay, like where are you coming from with this? What are your beliefs? What do you think is true? Why do you think we're having this conversation right now? Here's why I think we are. Here's what I want to get out of it. Um, so naming some of these things, and that can even include facts. Like this is the data that I have that has me believe the things that I believe. Um, so that's context. And even though it's supposedly reality, I have a context, you have a context and revealing that can be a big part of uh, getting the clarity with each other. And then another piece is concern. And this is where a lot of things like nonviolent communication and um, 
authentic relating and circling will often focus a lot on this, which is like, why? Like, what matters to you here? Um, what are your values? What are the stories that have you believe this? So this is kind of almost the more heart centered, like, what do you feel about this? Why, why are we even having this conversation um, from a personal level? Uh, and a way that you could reflect this even is like, what I think I get about you here, what I think I understand about your values, your, you know, what's here for you. You'll notice my voice even drops a little bit when I'm talking about it. It's like more of a, of a relational level. Um, and so we can even see this playing out to some extent in society right now. Um, so what you can do in conversation, and the reason I'm sharing this is if you notice that talking is happening at the level of content, if we're just going back and forth and we're kind of asserting our views but not getting anywhere, you can either go to context, like, okay, like, where are your views coming from? What are your beliefs here? What do you think is true? Um, you know, what what demographics or groups do you belong to that think that this is important? Um, even like, uh, to some extent, like, what social groups are you part of and the concern of like, what might happen if you didn't... Uh, if you, if you changed your view, like, what are you concerned about? Because some people will get kicked out of their social groups if they change their view. Like, so there's real concerns here. There's real things at stake. So the other thing you can go to are like, what are your motivations? Um, what do you care about? Why are we even having this conversation for you? Um, what's a story about a reason this matters to you? And depending on the person, you may have to go to either of these, or you can reveal them yourself. Um, like, okay, here's what I think we're having a conversation about. Um, here's what matters to me in the conversation. Here's why I'm even talking about it. Here are my motivations for those views in the first place. Um, and it really just depends on where the conversation is going. I'll usually bounce back and forth between these depending on what the other person's receptivity seems to be. Um, and uh, just like trying out different, different options in conversation. And the one and only John Viveki teaches our section on wisdom. He talks a lot about the need to cultivate what he calls dialogos, conversational practices that take us somewhere new. And I've never seen him so energized as he was at our recent State of Sense Making event on how we steal the culture. And you've had this when you've had those really great conversations in your life. It took on a life of its own. It went in a direction you could not have foreseen. And it reached into parts of your psyche you didn't realize or hadn't been touched. What's, what's so powerful in these practices is people often say, I didn't know that kind of intimacy was possible. And they say paradoxical things like it was so new, but it felt like that's always who I really was. They do this simultaneous, it's always been that way, and it's really radically new. Because what they're doing, right, is they're on, they're, they're participating in something that is not them, not just the other person, not just some sum, but something that has a life of its own dynamically between them. That's the logos. And what you're, we're doing in these practices is we're making the, we're making ourselves available. Notice how the language is, almost sounds religious. We're making ourselves available to the logos. Heraclitus said it way back when, you know, 500 and something BCE, don't listen to my words, but listen to the logos within them. That's what we're trying to do. Learn to listen, not just to the words, but to the logos within them. Because if we can, we can take that the collective intelligence of distributed cognition, and we could participate it in its weaving itself into collective wisdom. And that's the best thing we have for trying to deal with the hyper objects that we are trying to confront right now. And I know you've talked about stealing the culture, yes. which I think is, for me, it's exactly that. How do we, how do we mainstream these practices? How, we, how do we bring yeah. a countercultural movement around this sort of deeper sense of connection and communication? Thank you for asking that question, David. How do we steal the culture is basically the question. Uh, we've got five minutes, John. How do we steal the culture? Yeah, I'll do it right now. Okay. Um, so I'm going to say something a little bit provocative, but uh, uh, because we need to be provocative at this point. I think that what you pointed to, that, gra that gravity, I think we should use the word that people most spontaneously use in that situation. And it's old word, and we have to give up some of its old baggage, but, but we're, we're not... We're, we're not just making it a symbol, we're renewing it, we're revitalizing it. And that's the word spirit. This is a spiritual exercise. And, and it, these are spiritual practices because they really put you in touch 
with the flowing, present, transformative dynamic of collective wisdom. And that, to me, is a very good meaning for spirit. And I think it's what people really did mean. But we've lost that. And we've reduced it into some weird cartoonish image of a ghostly entity within us or something like that. And I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't mean to be too aggressive to some people's belief. But I don't know if that old picture is doing much work for us. It doesn't seem to be where this new model but perhaps of what was always being said, I'm willing to acknowledge that, that, that's spirit. And here's the proposal that ultimately what changes a civilization is to change the spirit of its culture. Um, this is, a, in some sense, a Hegelian idea, although I reject Hegel's reduction of everything to the propositional, right? And so think about... See, I, I, I sometimes... People get some, some people get angry with me. You should be more political, John. And I, I say, no... Because politics has degenerated to ideology, and ideology is saying all that matters is the propositional, and I'm deeply philosophically opposed to that. Also, I don't want to model this on the French or the Russian Revolution. I want to model what we're trying to do on the Axial Revolution or what Christianity did at, towards the collapse of antiquity. Christianity didn't overthrow the state. It, it didn't, right? It, it, it didn't do a political revolution. It didn't codify new laws until it had done something else. It created these little dialogical communities. Churches were originally in homes in which people were doing this. And where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. That's what Jesus was saying. They were doing this and then they were weaving those together and they created a new spirit. And, and, and you know, and, and, and think about things that we now take for granted that Christianity bestowed upon us how important agopic love is uh that we that we shouldn't ins that we shouldn't kill infants that infants are also people these ideas that we now take for granted they were bestowed on us by christianity i'm not a christian i'm not arguing for christianity please understand me i'm also not arguing against it what i'm saying is i'm pointing to historical examples there's one we can be aware of because it still is in our, the impact, the legacy of it is still in our culture today, of a group of people that stole a culture through dialogical practice and setting up new ways of seeing and being from the spirit as it was leading them. Listen to all, all this old language can make sense again, leading them in a new way. And, and here's the thing, and, and this is where maybe I, I might be a little bit distressing. They didn't save the Roman Empire. It couldn't be saved, but they laid the seeds, more than the seeds, they laid the living ecology of the new culture that was going to replace the Roman Empire. So that's my answer. So I hope you enjoyed the film. Details about the next course are below in the show notes. And since we started running it, it's become one of the most rewarding and exciting things we do, going on a shared journey of learning and growth together. So it would be great to see you there. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101 with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho-Hamilton, John Viveki, and more. Improve your sense-making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>